Hey, fellow workers, welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. You are tuning in to episode four of season one, and I am pleased to introduce our guest today. Our guest is Dominic Shaw, who happened to apparently be the first wheelchair bound person to ever repel in Calgary's annual Easter Seals drop zone. Welcome, Dominic, to our show. Thank you for having me. And just for clarification, um, my friend Ryan, who did it at the same time with me, he actually got down first. I just took oh. the spotlight. So, yeah. But That's I'll take awesome. it. <laughs> was he also in a wheelchair? Yes, he was. He was our sledge hockey goalie, actually. So. Okay, cool. So, two of you went down at the same time in wheelchairs? We did. Yes. That's awesome. Cool. Well, let's get right into it. So uh, tell us your life story. Like, where'd you grow up? What was your family life like? Where'd you go to school? And then, yeah, as you're talking about that, maybe um, incorporate your labor history, you know, your first job and what you're doing now and everything. In between. Um, uh, ask anybody that knows me and say, I just have like an unbelievable life. Um, some for the good, some for the bad. Um, as you can tell, I'm a person of color. I'm a black person. Uh, my Mother was Scottish. My father was uh, Jamaican. I was born in England, put up for adoption before I even hatched, I guess. Raised by nuns for the first two years of my life, adopted, brought to Canada, basically grew up in northern BC, northern Yukon. This is places like uh, Cassiar, Lower Post, Pele, Whitehorse. The longest place that we stayed was 13 years in a small um, indigenous community um, called Iskut, I-S-K-U-T. Literally population 300. My parents were teachers. We actually lived on the reservation. And um, one of the lucky things that I've, that I've had through my life is I haven't been, I guess, as aware of what racism is in that because sort of with isolation growing up there is, uh, I thought racism was just... Um, okay, they bring people on slave ships. Uh, it's not happening anymore. Don't worry about it type of thing. So it, it was what it was. It, it definitely helped shape me in that. Didn't have my first job until I moved to Whitehorse. I was 14. It was uh, McDonald's. Now, I've always had a bit of a disability. I had a spinal stroke when I was two. Pretty much recovered by the time I was about, let's say, 12. Didn't have a wheelchair. Did the Forrest Gump braces, uh, full body cast, archaic surgeries. <laughs> Times were different back then. It's like the Fred Flintstones of the uh, of the world uh, entering medical field, I guess. So it was very um, unique for me having that job um, because I was the fry guy. And half of me was telling it, dude, you're the fry guy, that sucks. But the other half was, I never expected to be working a job. Never mind working with my brother and my friends and this and actually making money like it was a big deal I didn't have a great I guess time growing up with parents and stuff like that one of the downsides was half of what I made went to my parents mm. which was you know your first job you're like 13 14 you're like come on man yeah all my friends are going to go to the movie well I'll see you next week because I can only go to every second one guys so sure. um at the same time, another, and this I only just remembered like about uh, a couple of weeks ago, my mother got me this job. It was like a summer student employment program thing up there. I was always very good with computers. So it was basically data entry. And it was working for a psychologist, taking childhood abuse cases and putting them into the computer. And I, I'm grateful. I, you know, the mind works in tremendous ways. And it, I literally blocked out so much stuff. Even as I'm talking to you now, I'm remembering like a different file and stuff like this. And I'm like, how is, how is that possible? Like what kind of human, what two people were responsible for putting me through that job? But obviously I got through to it, but yeah. parents don't, don't let your kids do jobs like that. Okay, it's not gonna <laughs> work out well. So yeah, the, the other thing about McDonald's is um. When I moved to Whitehorse, that was like the biggest city that I was in. And that was when I had like really my first best friends. When I had a realization that what's going on at home was not normal and I needed to get out. Ironically, the McDonald's owner, he took me aside one day and said, well, hey, what's going on? I guess he picked up on clues and I told him the whole works. And I right. said, hey, I'm, I'm secretly hatching a plan to, to move to Toronto with some friends. And oh, wow. 
And he actually helped me because of the, um, the way that my money was being taken. He actually ended up buying me the plane ticket, which probably saved my life, I, I do have to say. And unfortunately, he has passed. I, I did get to say thank you to his daughter because I, I don't think anybody really knew what was going on. And all of a sudden, there's Dom, one of two Black guys in the whole high school, the only guy with... Uh, a wheelchair temporarily and boom he's gone so i i you know wanted people to know that hey i still exist (laughs) (laughs) when i went to toronto um boom culture shock boom you know what eyes on the back of my head made some mistakes societal mistakes but um was determined i would work like a dog i think one time i had a full-time job and three part-time jobs like smokes and went to um, high school part-time to finish out. You mm-hmm. moved to Toronto before you finished high school? Yep. Oh, okay. How old were you? 15, uh, 15, ah, 15 okay. and a half, I was in Toronto. Okay. Had half my grade 10 done. One of the jobs um, was in uh, the Hilton Hotel as a dishwasher. And it was union, though it was um, more of the, the banquet seasonal. So the first like couple months were like, oh, there's not much work, but I would just work like a dog. And because of my disability, I had a great upper body and really great hand-eye coordination. You put me at any sort of machine level work, boom, I'm amazing, right? So I got more and more hours and um, my supervisor, um, Martin, he was a black guy, which was very unusual for me. Like he's probably like the, maybe the fourth actual black person I've met in person (laughs) up to Um, that point yeah and you know what he bent me favors uh I remember the um we had the cafeteria an employee cafeteria which was free as long as you're working and I remember a big black lady in there and without even me telling her um what I'm about or where I'm from she would literally say you know what you need to eat a good meal I don't care if you're working or not you come in here every day Nice. And I was like, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> and like we had uh, little punch cards and she'd always make sure I had two punch cards so I could, I guess, take advantage. But little things like that. What a great help they were to me. Honestly, a, a, a actual home cooked meal. I mean, you're 15. You got money. It's Slurpees and Doritos, right? You'd eat those forever. Sure. The other thing that happened at the Hilton, my actual boss boss, Dorian, he actually gave me my first car. It was a Toyota to sell. It needed little things like it needed its spark plugs cleaning. And he literally gave it to me because he got another one. He was almost like a big brother to me, to be honest. One day he called me in to the general manager of the whole hotel. And this is like, my God, this is really serious. Like, and one of the things that I did, I volunteered on the weekends when I had time early in the morning, like six o'clock, because I love to cook. I'd be cracking eggs like literally a thousand eggs with the cooks they'd be laughing at me i'd be like i don't care i'm part of you guys right and that totally paid off because they ended up sending me to cooking school unfortunately i finished the cooking school i worked for the hilton for a bit i had a brother that passed so i came on out west to live with my sister because she was uh, concerned about me and she's really the only relative that i had that i got along with one of the things that i discovered Pretty fast. I, I, I want to say that, you know, I was a smart kid, a smart guy, but sometimes I, I caught on stuff a little late and I applied to like tons of places for jobs as a cook. Man, look, I'm from Toronto. Like I work at the Hilton. Hello. Yeah. Um, I couldn't get a job. Couldn't get a job. Huh. And then it sprang on me one day. I'm like, you know, I, I got to apply as a freaking dishwasher. I have to prove myself. Apply as a dishwasher, pretty much any job you want. Two weeks later, yeah, you're the cook. You're wow, you're amazing. But getting the dishwasher's wage. You guys listening, you can take that for what it is. I, as a person of color, as a person with a disability, I don't have time. I don't have the mental fortitude to be worrying about that stuff. I got to pay bills. I have to live. And, you know, you just go on with it. Now I'm obviously a little older a lot more secure i can go and start you know advocating and fighting that you know type of garbage that's going on in the world and the more you know that i advocate for 
an example, the more I see it blatantly right in front of me. And, you know, people always say, well, you know, if more people stood up, we wouldn't have the problem. Well, people can't afford to stand up mentally or financially. They have Absolutely. to provide. Yeah. And yeah, it's, you know, it's a very, I want to say North America take advantage of people system. Yeah. But it's a culture that, you know what, not enough people want to break. Along my travels, I've worked a lot of jobs, um, a lot of blue collar jobs. And there's some amazingly, just outstandingly smart, kind and goodwill people that their lives are literally being half wasted because they don't get, they don't get to show off these uh, skills or opportunities or, or things that they have. Right. So, yeah, right. Yeah. So when it comes to work in Canada, I'm, I'm going to give it like a literally a, a C minus, to be honest. Yeah. That's a pretty hard score. Honestly, I, I'm going to be real with you here, Kim. Canada has a big ego problem. In my, <laughs> in my circumstances, my, this is only my opinion. I was adopted here. Didn't have a say in it. Was beaten black and blue. Raised up north. No resources to go to. No, I couldn't go to the police. There was no investigations or anything. I had a grew up with a disability. We didn't even talk about accessibility. It was, Dom, can you get over the fence yourself? We'll take your whatever crutches and throw them over. But that's all you're getting. Moving on, you know, we look at Canada. There were people living here before. The Indigenous. Okay. Yeah. A bunch of people came over and decided, nope, our way or the highway. And you know what? We need a railroad grill. Well, we'll bring over some Irish and Chinese. Pay them like crap. Make sure they don't make enough to get home. Yeah. Oh, so there's a little problem going on in the in the south here you know a bunch of blacks are being treated as slaves well you know what come on up okay come on up to nova scotia and you know what we'll, we'll give you jobs but not enough to you know ever prosper off and we're still going to make sure you have the crappy jobs yeah of course so <laughs> i i really struggle well what is canada so proud about guys now we're actually starting to engage in conversation about re reconciliation after it literally having found murderous graves under our noses. Sure. And it's not often I go, go off and go hard, but Canada, you know what? You need to do better, honestly. Yeah. Like Canada for a long time has whitewashed its history and has mm -hmm. been proud of, you know, we're better than the United States, the United States, they're the bad guys, <laughs> but we're the nice, polite people. It's nothing to be proud about. Like you know, if I want to say, if I want to actually have a good night's sleep, which, which I strive for every day, I don't compare myself to anybody else but myself. That's smart. So what was it like uh, working at McDonald's as your first job? You know, you, oh, you, were, you already had your disability to an extent. So mm -hmm. what was that like? And, and to be honest, my first job was McDonald's. My first real job was McDonald's. And I also was the fry cook. Oh, sweet <laughs> that, you got you, you got the uh, z in the salt shaker but the only um, disability i had was flat feet so you probably had a little bit more challenging time than i did you know how mcdonald's is built where everything is really sort of close together two people yeah. can pass i mean that really worked for me because i could literally like have my hands on everything and sort of wall walk right okay so okay. i was bouncing around grill no problem i hated doing counter i really did because yeah. you'd have to walk in the open carry drinks not for me out of McDonald's, I, you know what? I, do, I don't know if it's the same. I really doubt it anymore. You have your little handbook and it really teaches you how to be a good worker, as in how to work hard, how to achieve quality, how to recover from your mistakes, how to communicate with your coworkers and your management. I really, really like what McDonald's did for me. Yeah. Because I have an understanding from a very early age of what a business needs and how to help that business. And therefore that business can turn around and, and pat you on the back, right? Moving uh, to Toronto, one of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the jobs that I did continue was I worked at uh, McDonald's part-time, literally right on Young Street, just south of Bloor, the bad McDonald's. And I kind of liked that job because on Saturday nights, I would do... Um, I forget what they call it, but basically I'd be the lobby guy. 
And I didn't have to change the garbage. I didn't have to pick up a mop. I was basically the McDonald's bouncer. It was great. I mean, 16 years old, I was a big kid, but downtown Toronto, yeah, okay, let's go. It was really exciting for me. One of the other things, I got to work at the Sky Dome, which uh, when it opened, they had a competition. Any of the local Toronto stores, if you wanted to work there, the best counter person and the best grill person, and you got a $2 an hour raise. That was amazing that I got it, made a lot of money. And I mean, can you imagine $2 like... What, almost 30 years ago that's a huge raise yeah, got absolutely. to see uh madonna concerts prince concerts so many baseball games like that probably i have to say probably kept me out of drugs and gangs <laughs> to wow. be honest i ain't gonna lie your job kept you out of drugs and gangs <laughs> it pretty much because i mean all my friends they worked at mcdonald's and all they all we wanted to do is you know what either play baseball in Regent Park and hopefully not get shot or have our bike stolen or go to uh, baseball games. Sure. And like that's, that, that's what we lived and breathed. So. Yeah. Cool. Were things fairly accommodating at subsequent jobs that you've had? Not always. I've been very lucky because I, somebody told me, I just have a look in my eye that I'm a hard worker and I don't skim. And I know that, you know, there are jobs which Somebody else could have done one part of the job better than me, but I made it up for it in the rest. I can't really say that my disability ever really got in the way of any jobs. I mean, even though I had at worst from about 20 to 35, a slight gait, a noticeable gait, I was a doorman in, out West for 15 years. I wasn't okay. the biggest guy. I wasn't the best fighter, but I had the um, I had the communication abilities that a lot didn't. And uh, I literally would go from working five nights a week in Victoria at a gay bar to working two nights in the same week at the roughest, meanest bar where the Hells Angels are, where it's 50 cent draft night, where it's, you know, game on, doesn't matter. Sure. So, I mean... I, if anything, I learn as I go, and I've been very well-rounded. In a lot of my jobs, I, I always remember, I was very lucky coming across key people saying the right things at the right time. From uh, a Portuguese McDonald's manager, God, I can never remember her name. She was pregnant, and whenever we did uh, Martin Brower, that's basically unloading of the trucks for supplies late at night, um, she would always take us out. For, for lunch. And I remember her taking a side to me once, pulling me aside and saying, Dom, you're a very hard worker. Don't let people take advantage of you. And for years, I couldn't, couldn't understand that. And then I saw, finally started taking or understanding it when people got paid more for me doing the same job. The only difference is the color of our skin. <laughs> and it's right. like, that happens a lot, man. It's, yeah, yeah, it's brutal. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Like I, like I said, I've had to have the blinders on because it's just survivability. I don't have time to, to be mentally fighting it or financially fighting it. Okay. And it's too much to risk, right? Like, right. I never really understood trauma and stuff like this. And it seems the more that I, you know, advocate for disability and racism, the more that I realize that how much stuff I've blocked out. It's like, wow. I mean, I know I'm a, always come across as a happy guy and comedy. I mean, that's been my vice, but I'll tell you, I have days where I just, I'm like a 13 year old razor and I, I will literally lock myself in my apartment and not go out. I still have those days. And, you know, I start to question why I have those days and where they come from. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's that type of thing where your, your mind works in mysterious ways. And I believe in, in balance. And if you're not balancing yourself, it'll find a way to do it for you. So yeah, that makes sense. So you're in Toronto. How'd you get to Alberta? How did I get? So um, I had a brother that passed and my sister lived in uh, Delta, BC. She was worried about me in Toronto. When I was living in Whitehorse, my sister was older and they were going to um, high school actually in Victoria, BC. And I remember my sister, we, we go down there one summer and we visit. And I remember my sister saying one time, you know what, you have to be really careful when you go out at night. I'm like, why? And she told me about this story about a group of white guys just 
kicking the beep out of this black person. And I never really understood it, but she, even though that she grew up in the same, I guess, sort of isolation, she got out earlier and started seeing racism is not just indigenous, it's about all skin colors. And right. man, Dom, Dominic's gonna have his hands full, right? Was your so sister that, a person of color as well? No, no, my whole family was white. Oh, okay. But like I said, you know, key people say key things that you always remember. That was one of the things that always stuck out. And I'm like, I, I never wanted to be that guy in that position just by her saying it. I was like, you know, when you have literally sort of one family member that says, hey, you know what, I'm there for you no matter what. Yeah. Um, you don't want to let them down. Sort of sure. thing. Yeah, right. that makes sense. So I came out and I lived with her for, I think, about half a year, worked in bars for numerous years, and then literally just got sort of, sort of sick of it. I guess I just sort of grew out of it all one day. I had some friends in Calgary, and I just picked up and, and moved and okay. literally walked into a, it was basically kind of like a molding factory slash sawmill. Yeah. I had a friend that worked there. I remember it was snowing that day. And I mean, I grew up in snow. It's like, whatever, <laughs> minor inconvenience. And I just walked up, walked almost basically right into the plant, found the supervisor and said, hey, I'm here to work. I heard that you're hiring, so I'm here to work. Almost like bullied him into a job. <laughs> and I ended, I ended up working there for like 12 years. Like all my friends, they still work there. We call it the sawdust factory. But yeah, I did really, really good there. But it was a very, very physical job and that's what damage was done to me before I probably ended up uh, uh, pushing the envelope I remember one of my good friends said uh, Gord he said uh, to me one day and we do uh, like four days 12 hours and stuff like that right and I remember one day I think it was a Sunday and we're off I got out of the car and I was like my back hurts so much I literally like like crawled inside kind of half laughing right and he goes, Dom, like, what are you doing? Like, honestly, you're going to kill yourself. And I said, you know what, Gord, in the back of my mind, you know what? It's always been something could happen. But the one thing that I have to do is while I have it, I have to use it. Because, yes, I will get taken care of, but this will allow me mentally to accept it. So right. I said, I don't care if I'm crawling for the next three weeks. I'm going to work until I'm broken. Maybe I shouldn't have been that gung-ho, but... <laughs> whatever <laughs> can't change it now <laughs> yeah yeah well maybe WestJet will give me a time machine so i made a smoking seat as well uh -huh. Sorry, i'm a little upset at that um so where are you at now where, where are you working now before covid i was using a wheelchair for about the last 12 years and literally after one month out of after i was in my chair I ended up working for my wheelchair bender. Uh, the owner's name was Bob. Worked for him for nine years because uh, I was so heavy on my chair in the first month, so rough on my chair. Right. I would literally say, guys, just, just send the parts. I'll fix it myself, okay? These delivery guys <laughs> don't know what they're doing, right? <laughs> and one of the delivery guys, well, you should come work for us. I'm like, well, I don't know. Put in a good word. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and next thing you know, I had an interview. And I remember at the interview, they are like, uh, so how much do you want? And I said, well, I'm on ace. So honestly, like, I don't care. Just pay me $900 for like a month's work. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, I, re I refuse to give away money. Like I would rather volunteer half my time. And we ended up basically working on trade, um, oh, okay. banking hours and trade. I mean, I got a nice, you know, grandma's bed and stuff like that. After that, he moved on, and then I sort of moved on, and I ended up um, having my own company uh, and had that for three years, and it was really more um, specific to, I guess, not just wheelchairs, but to adaptive sporting equipment and stuff like that, really unique stuff. All right. Um, so I had a lot of fun with it, and the way I did it, I, I literally went to a wheelchair company in Edmonton and said, hey, you don't have a store in Calgary. I know the people. I can run the whole store. I can do everything. Rent the store, pay the overhead. I'll pay the staff. We'll split the profits. You, you bring the inventory. And I did a whole business plan and everything. And they bit right away. And I was like, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> I know. I know. 
with that, again, um, just even being in the terror, my health started going down, COVID started going, and we had a lot of um, times that we're working in senior centers and that. And I thought, you know what, I almost got lucky because they could, I think that um, the owners could sort of see that, that I'm waning. And they say, hey, you know what, um, let's not renew the contract. We'll just pay you. We'll give you $40 an hour if you want. And I said, you know what, I'm, I'm not in it for the money. I'm really not. And I said, you know what, honestly, take over my employees, buy my tools, and, and I'm free. Most of the money that I had went right into my RDSP. I oh. had to, well, because I was still on age and I had to yeah. sort of shelter it. And, you know, uh, one of the biggest things, I guess, about me is like when you grow up poor, literally for the, all your life and you come across, you know, a good year of a really good income, it destroys you. And you're like, I kind of wish I was poor again. Yeah, I and, can uh, see that. I just don't want to be rich, honestly. I mean, unless it's like, you know, 20 million dollars and <laughs> buy, i can buy twitter or something but so yeah i, I kind of walked away from it I, I probably could have got a lot more of it but you know what my whole focus was creating a store with an environment which is really focused on the people and getting unique niche things that people want and that's what that store did and um, calgary was missing a lot of that so then i started um i always loved video games I remember my mother saying, you'll never make a, a living out of playing video games. <laughs> and I streamed for like uh, almost the first two years of COVID. Oh, wow. And yeah, I, I can't say which character or anything because it's... Sure, that's fine. But I ended up my last check for one week of streaming, which is about only 30 hours, was $400 US. It's terribly demanding, like mentally, if you want to be at the top, you have to do your research, your homework, prepare for it. You know, it's, it's literally an acting job, right? Yeah. Very demanding. So I ended up talking with the social services minister at the time, Rajan, and I was basically complaining about CERB and advocating for people on CERB because I had employees, which though they went to the other company, all of a sudden they got basically laid off and they're on CERB and they were employees with disabilities that I hire as well. So they were on age too. Okay. And then we had to fight for our CERB on age and that. And again, I, I, I don't want to sound egotistical, but I'm very, very lucky. I have good communication techniques with people and we still talk to these days. And to this day, one of the things that she did, she appointed me on premier's council. My job is to listen with another group of nine, listen to our disability community and find solutions and offer advice to government in power. So it's completely nonpartisan. Right. It's about working with government, it's working with community and finding you know, the best for both worlds, right? I really do enjoy it actually. I work in a wheelchair shop for probably 13 years, you think you would know everything disability like inside and out. But one thing that I've have learned on there is like, there's so many different, unique um, examples of disability that we just don't regularly interact with, like uh, hard of sight or, or deaf people. They're just yeah. not that many common. And their challenges are in some cases are even harder than mine. And mine are like just mobility. Can you get up these stairs or not? I do a lot of work on that. I probably do more solo local city level work than anything. I don't like aligning or tying myself necessarily to an organization. I encourage people to advocate for themselves, solo, for their neighbors, whatever. And um, yeah, that's what I'm up to now. So kind of really came full circle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's quite the story. There's uh, there's a lot in there. Nah, I um, think it's only half over, unfortunately. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you never know what the I, future holds. That's what I meant with the future. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> cool. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that. That's uh, that's really fascinating. I was uh, I was quite quite enthralled with the story that you're sharing with us. Uh, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave with our listeners before we sign off? When, especially with COVID even with myself, but I noticed among, um, I guess my community a lot more, cabin fever and anxiety. Going back out is 
really, really hard for a lot of people. Yeah. We went and saw Top Gun and nice. it was okay. Just the first five minutes of going out the door, I was just so angry at the world. Mm. I really wanted to go with my friends and do it. And I knew I was gonna, but I just didn't. I was so angry. As soon as I saw my friends, we were fine. And, you know, we had a great time. And the normal challenges of, okay, you can't sit there. You have to sit in an accessible spot. Well, no, I get out of my, you know what? People need to just remember that we're all human beings with all sensitivities and emotions. And even though some of us may not show them, it doesn't mean that we're just raging inside, especially coming out of COVID. There's a lot of people that are really struggling mentally, and it's going to be probably generations before we as, I guess, a, a, I want to say country, but it's more than that. It's probably the world really, you know, get a grip on our mental health. I, I honestly see a lot, a couple generations of damage done because yeah. of COVID. I still know people uh, in the building that I live in that it's almost like a joke to them now because they haven't left their apartment for, for over 900 days. Wow. Can you imagine what 900 days, like we're in Canada, we're in Calgary, we're in Alberta, really 900 days. They just don't have the mental support. They don't have a family support. They don't have a financial support. There's always a key factor seems to be missing in everybody's life. And, you know, one bad word I know I'm a joker and I know I like to, you know, push buttons in that, but people can tell when you're being mean and when you're not. Yeah. And you know what? People just need to dial their meanness to back the back a fucking couple of notches. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you for those thoughts. Um, so if people are interested in, um, you know, following you finding more of this sort of things you have to say mm -hmm. is there anywhere they go to do that like if you have a blog or socials that they could follow or anything like that if you don't see me out in the street of calgary um <laughs> i do have um my natural twitter which is dom cal one okay. um the thing about the uh, twitter and my natural account i don't necessarily like to engage sure. um but you know what if you, you're welcome to send me a dm if you have a question or anything I have no problem engaging. I just choose not to go out and have crazy discussions like, you know, old people do on Twitter these days. I don't know why they do that. <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just as old as you, I think. So I'm probably close. <laughs> just a little well, less feral. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, on yeah. that note, if people are interested in following the Alberta Worker, you can follow us on uh, social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can also check out our website at albertaworker.ca, where you can subscribe, of course, to this podcast and to our newsletter. We have a daily, weekly, and monthly newsletter. The daily newsletter is just the news article that we published that day. The weekly is a summary of the five articles we published that week. And the monthly is just the four articles that were the most viewed that month. If you liked this podcast episode, please rate and review our podcast and you can support the Alberta Worker by going to albertaworker.ca slash support. If you're interested in being a guest on the Alberta Worker, just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca and we thank again everybody for tuning in and thank you especially to Dominic for joining us today and as always, solidarity. A minute for the free Skittles. <laughs> 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 <laughs>